Well, good morning, church. I just realized we haven't been to church for, uh, this is probably third Sunday. We're way, um, all right, we got back two Tuesdays ago. We had to celebrate, be at another church last Sunday. So I've missed all of you. Nice to see you this morning. You know, it's nice for you to say you missed me too, you know. Uh, <laughs> You just look at me. Uh, I, I know, just like you notice my nice shirt I put on for you this morning. Well, let's praise the Lord. The Bible says that let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Ephesians 3.20 reminds us that our God is able to do exceeding abundantly above what we dare think, desire, hope. Oh, he's able to do a thousand times more. I think we need to get to the point where we just don't want to know he's able to do it. But he begins to actually actualize it in our lives. And when we read scripture, I believe fervently that we must see those words becoming flesh. If we are reading scripture like books and novels, we will never access the true power of God. We have to allow those words to jump out and become real for us because the Bible is like no other book. So when we read scripture, let us see Jesus Christ because he's the word. The word that became flesh and everything in this Bible is written about our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, let every addiction in this place be broken today in the name of Jesus. Those who are addicted to alcohol, oh Lord my God, free them from that bondage in the name of Jesus. Those who are addicted to tobacco, free them from that bondage. Those who are addicted to any other type or sort of addiction, free them from that bondage right now in the name of Jesus. Because your word declares that according to the power that is at work within us, you are able to do far above anything with their hope, think, or desire. Let it be true for every single individual in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Whoever that is for, take it. Receive it. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you all honor, glory, all power, all adoration. You are sovereign Lord. You are God all by yourself. There is none like you. None, Father. None like you. You are an awesome God. The Bible calls you the ancient of days. Because you always existed. Even before time began. You are the one that took a chunk of eternity and called it time. But you live above time. The Bible says you sit above the circle of the universe. You are creator and you are sustainer of every living thing. The Bible says that your love for us, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Not angels, not principalities, not powers, no anything created can separate us. No hunger, no peril, no sword can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Father, that is a huge promise that we need to grab hold of. 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells, 3.17 tells us where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Spirit of the Lord is here. So each and every one of us, Lord, we are free. We are free. 
O oh Lord my God, we are free. But remind us, your children, of that fact and that reality. So when we are feeling despondent, when we are feeling lost and hopeless, you are just a breath away, Lord. All we need to do is just say, Lord, and there you are. There you are, Father. There you are. Always willing, always willing, always willing to help. You are called our standby. You are called our advocate. You are called our strengthener. Oh, Lord, my God, you are called our helper. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Even until the end of time. We give you praise this morning. We give you all adoration, all power, all honor, all glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. This morning, I want to talk a little bit about uh, title is the price of one sin. The price of one sin. First, a little bit of context. The teaching ministry of our Lord Jesus in chapter 4 of Luke chapter 4 seemed to attract large crowds, including the despised tax collectors and others who were considered sinners. Now, when we read the word sinner, I don't think we uh, really emphasize what they mean by sinners. So let's look a little bit at the Amplified and see how the Amplified Bible communicates this particular word, sinner. Verse 1 of chapter 15 says, Now the tax collectors and notorious and especially wicked sinners were all coming near to Jesus to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes kept muttering and indignantly complaining, saying, This man accepts and receives welcomes sinners, preeminently wicked sinners, and he eats with them. So Jesus Christ told them this parable. So when you see the word sinner, the Bible is emphasizing these are extremely wicked, notoriously wicked individuals. So that changes the dynamic. Okay? Although our Lord reproved their sins, yet many of them acknowledged that he was right and in true repentance acknowledged Jesus as Lord. Wherever the Lord Jesus found people who were willing to acknowledge their sin, he gravitated toward them and bestowed spiritual help and blessing upon them. The Pharisees and the scribes resented the fact that Jesus fraternized with people who were avowedly sinners. They did not show grace to these social and moral outcasts, and they were indignant at Jesus for doing so, for showing grace. This led to the laying of a charge on Jesus Christ that this man receives sinners and he even eats with them. The charge was, of course, true, and they thought it blameworthy, not realizing that this was in absolute fulfillment of the reason Jesus Christ came to the world. So it was in answer to their charge of this man receives and eats with sinners that the Lord Jesus Christ recounted the three parables in Luke chapter 15. The first parable, of course, we understand to be that of the lost sheep. The second parable, of course, the parable of the lost coin. And then the third, which we will not go into today, is the parable of the lost son or popularly known as the prodigal son. That was the reason Christ gave them these parables, because of the accusations and the charge. Okay. 
These stories were aimed directly at the scribes and the Pharisees who thought they were super righteous themselves and they saw no need for repentance as they did not consider themselves lost. The point of these three stories is that God receives real joy and satisfaction where he sees sinners repentant. Whereas he obtains no gratification for self-righteous hypocrites who are too proud to admit their own wretched sinfulness. He has no joy in people like that. Luke chapter 15 contains three distinct parables that explain why Jesus associates with sinners. The linkage is evident in the terms lost and found, which is the theme that runs through these uh, at this chapter and rejoice and celebrate all three parables in this chapter end with similar statements rejoice and celebrate lost and found as we'll uncover in a moment the theme of Jesus association with sinners is important to bear in mind this unit involves a twin parable followed by what is popularly known as an example story. Another example story is obviously the parable of the Good Samaritan. That's what's called an example story. It's part of the ones we are visiting this morning. The parable's drama is built on the tension of an attempt to find something that has been lost. Any one of us who has lost something, especially something of real value, which, would, which, we, which probably happens to us on a regular basis, will understand or can identify with this tension. Whenever we have lost something of real value, we can all understand frustration, the anxiety sometimes, Sometimes the hopelessness or the despondency of the situation when we have looked and looked and searched and searched and searched. And when we finally or eventually find it, we can all relate to the sigh of relief, the joy and momentary happiness that visits us. Jesus tells these parables to tax collectors and sinners. Thus, the stories offer comfort especially in the face of the Pharisees and scribes grumbling at Jesus for inviting sinners and eating with them. It was the criticism of the religious authorities, the ones who make and enforce the rules, and judge who is and isn't worthy. It was their grumbling and complaining that Jesus to respond by telling them these stories about being lost. Jesus begins with a pastoral saying that would have been familiar in Antiquitous Palestine or Palestine of Antiquity, Old Palestine. A shepherd had a hundred sheep, a count that would indicate his modestly wealthy because the average herd is between 20 to 200. So having a hundred means you are moderately well off, doing well. The reference there I put, of course, I discovered that is Jeremiah's, who did an amazing work of bringing to life a lot of the issues in the times of Jesus, all right? Helping us understand in contemporary day. Such flocks were an economic resource since they provided wool and moth. During the count as he gathers the sheep at day's end, the shepherd notices that one of the sheep is missing. This shepherd cares for each and every one of his sheep. Let us remember that Jesus Christ is the one being pictured here. He is the shepherd and we are the sheep. And he cares for each and every one of the sheep. Each and every one is 
precious in his sight. Whether they are maimed, whether they're disabled, whether they are whatever, the each and every human soul is of great importance to Jesus Christ. Clearly, this shepherd is a model of our loving God. Then the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes out looking after that one sheep that's missing. He left the 99 and went after that one. The point we need to get into our minds and hearts here is the extravagance of God's love. The extravagance of God's love. I was listening to a super preacher once and he mentioned he was having this argument with God that the Lord told him to fuel his plane and fly all the way to Israel from the U.S. And he said, why, Lord? See, there's a lady waiting at the airport. I want you to go meet her. And he said, I should fuel my jet, fly all the way from Texas, and fly to Israel for one lady? He said, Lord, give me a break. There must be somebody else in Israel who's close by who can take care of this lady. And the Lord told him, if I want you to fuel your jet and fly all the way to Israel for that daughter of mine, then do it. After all, I can afford it. The extravagance of God. This woman had prayed specifically. And God was answering that prayer. That is the God we serve. If we do not task God, if we don't ask we don't receive. What you ask, he will give to you. He's happy to give to the kingdom. So God is extravagant. He left the 99 and went in pursuit of that one. Because this demonstrates his love, his care, and his mercy to each and every one of us. The shepherd would have done exactly the same thing for the other 99. Exactly the same thing. Jesus' original hearers probably assumed that the shepherd asks a neighbor to keep an eye on the 99 so he can search for the missing sheep. Though the story does not offer this detail to us, the sheep needs to be found nonetheless. Otherwise, it may be permanently lost or attacked or devoured by a predator. It is risky to be a lost sheep. So Christ is admonishing us today about the importance of one lost life outside of him. The search, thankfully, was successful. The shepherd located his sheep, lifted it on his shoulder, and took it home. Considering anything could have happened to the sheep, maybe even devoured by a lion, the shepherd was overjoyed and truly rejoices at finding it. This parable demonstrates Father God's deep and intense desire to search for sinners and bring them into the safety of the fold. As demonstrated by the shepherd throwing a party in celebration of the find, as our Lord Jesus Christ puts it, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need repentance or see any need for repentance. When a sinner turns to God, heaven throws a party. The prospect of such joy keeps Jesus associating with sins. Now the second parable. The parable, the second parable parallels the first. Here a silver coin has been lost. It sounds as if the coin is a drachma. A drachma, you've got to realize, equals a day's wage. So let's not just think about a 5p coin or a 10p coin. This potentially could have been 50 pounds, could have been 100 pounds, could have been 300 pounds, could have been 500 pounds, depending on what you earn in a day. So that's a day's wage that's gone missing. 
So this is clearly important to this lady. However, as with many things that are dropped or lost, the search begins with the certainty that it must be in here somewhere. This happened to all of us. It happens to me all the time. Where was the last place I was? Okay, I've not been out, so it's got to be in the house here somewhere. Because I haven't gone out yet. So my search has got to be limited. It's in just the house. So you're relieved. It's got to be in here somewhere. Okay. The search must have taken place in the evening or night, because we are told she lit a lamp to search for it. She sweeps the house clean. Usually, you find places you haven't been to for a while dusty. You find places you've not swept for a while under the city or somewhere. You find things the kids have hidden under the... Uh, you begin to find things you never knew, and you have an opportunity to clean clean that particular place. Because I know I'm not the only one who this happened to. So she swept the house clean, looking carefully until it turned up. Thank you. We can almost hear her breathe this huge sigh of relief and probably with a satisfactory smile. There it is. Relief as the search ends successfully and just like the shepherd, this woman calls her friends together for serious celebration because of the discovery of that lost coin. So there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents or one sinner who is found. The reference to angels is a circumlocution for God's joy, extravagant emphasis on the joy of God. The courts of heaven are full of praise when a sinner turns to God. Is there any significant difference between the two parables? Think about it. At their most basic level, they make the same point. The second parable, however, stresses the search a little more than the first. Recovering a lost sinner can take diligent effort. But the effort is worth it when the lost is found. Sinners should know that God is diligently looking for them. They should know that. They are not looking for God. God is looking for them. We as disciples of Christ should diligently engage in the search for sinners on behalf of our master whom we prefer to serve. Jesus provides a clear example for us to follow. Finding lost sheep and missing coins is a disciple's priority. Jesus involved himself with sinners, so should we as his disciples. So, how many times in our lives do we stray away from what is best for us? How many times in our lives do we stray away from the love and care of God, who is our shepherd? I learned something a while ago, that when I find I have fallen into some kind of sin or the other, your natural tendency is to hide from God, like he cannot see you. There's just some, this is why they say sin separates us from God. It's not God, it's us, it's our conscience. We think, uh, all right, I mean, I remember uh, in my less mature years in the faith, I'll be thinking, I'll just give it three days, days. I've forgotten, I'll just come back, I'll, I'll be the same. And two days, I'll pretend, uh, uh, you're probably looking at me, as look at this child, you know. But there's something in us. And when I've heard, uh, you know, I feel funny going back to God because the enemy is at hand. You know, it's called the accuser of the brethren. He does not miss an opportunity like that. Is it you raising holy hands? You did that yesterday, have you? Look at this. You are a joke. The enemy wants to tell you you are not worthy. Jesus loves you even when you have erred or committed that sin. So the first thing you do, I have learned to do that. Father, I'm sorry I let you down. I'm sorry I let you down, Lord. I said, thank God, Father. I am not habitually like this. Immediately, I go back and pay homage. And he has let you off immediately. As opposed to hiding from him, thinking he's not seeing you. Or I. He is. Straight back into the fold. Sorry, Father. Call him back. Sorry. Yeah. Because he's practical. He's real. 
Okay? So how many times do we stray from whom we have called our shepherd? How often do we stray in body or in spirit away from the flock? The church, which is our home and the place in which we live out our faith. How many times have we strayed away from the church? I believe, for example, at the beginning of every worship in the church, we should all take a moment to evaluate ourselves privately before the start of any worship. We should evaluate ourselves and identify ourselves. Areas we have fallen short away from God. By ourselves, we ought to do it. It is good for us to say, Father, we have sinned. Or we sin. Recognize it. It is good to say, have mercy. And it's good for us to hear an assurance of pardon from God. An assurance of God's forgiveness and mercy. As we then begin to worship him. We take a moment to present our lives before God again. Before we get too hard like the Pharisees who never see anything wrong that they do. Here's the hard part. We have to put ourselves in the place of the judgmental Pharisees and scribes. These are the 99, the ones who think they have it all together. And it's those other people over there who need to repent before we can let them into our community, into our lives. You know, Christians are some of the most judgmental people you know. You know so many people are scared of Christians. They run away from Christians. Because a lot of them are not mature enough to know Jesus Christ loves everybody. God did not say you hate the homosexual. He didn't say you accused the homosexual. He didn't say you showed the homosexual hatred, resentment. All right? He never said that. Because he loves the homosexual. Does not like the sin. But likes the person. And as Christians, that's our job. We must show the love of Christ and not be too quick to say sinners. Sinners. That's what Christ is trying to teach us. Even better, do we ourselves find ourselves tugging along with Jesus as he heads to look for the lost? Maybe we can lend a hand. Maybe we can support him. And do we rejoice when they are found? Are we willing to sit down at the party with all of God's children lost and now found, including us? I know that we are all, at times, lost children. As I close this message, sometimes we are running away and need someone to care enough to come looking for us. How many of us probably notices we have not seen Peter, Jane, Paul, Adi, whomever for three weeks or for one month. How many of us actually think, hmm, I wonder what happened to that lady or that gentleman. I've not seen them for a while. Let me inquire. Now, how many of us truly do that? When we come into church, we call this the house of God. We're coming as it's, it's some kind of um, uh, formality, we're in church, we sing, we go. But how many of us are truly living scripture? Where's that man? Where's that woman? Where's that child? Where's that young person? Uh, how, well, how's your brother? How's your sister? How's your husband? How's your wife? How's, I mean, not every moment, not every minute, but I mean, if you've not seen them for a little while, inquire. Why? This is a body. Whether you're white, you're Asian, you're black, it's one body. One. Okay? One body. Church is not a building. Church is the body of Christ. It's the collection of people who have professed love and servitude to Jesus Christ. That's what a church is. So as I close, The good news is that there is someone who cares enough for you and I to come looking for us. The one who loves us comes to get us. 
and bring us safely home in his home. So let us all, us all as we are gathered here today, rejoice for we were once lost ourselves and now we are found. As the hymn goes, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Isn't it amazing? What an amazing grace. And this is example, exactly the message I believe the Lord wants me to bring to us today. Praise God.